recording session. I'd like to welcome everyone to the online multimedia sampler. Uh, my name is Dan Cabrera, the multimedia coordinator for faculty development, and today we'll be talking about the diversity, the range of different multimedia workshops that I offer throughout the uh, the year. I just want to uh, mention that I, I, I use Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, what we're in right now. In fact, I had a session last night with my PHHE 435 and 535 course. It went very well. Uh, I also recorded it, and I had a session this morning, or I, I uh, had an opportunity to make that recording available for students who may not have been able to make the class, or students who were, were there in the class but still uh, would like to, to have a review. Uh, they may not have caught everything as the... Uh, uh, as they listened in the class and participated. So the agenda for today's workshop, the uh, multimedia workshop, is um, uh, we're going to list the objectives, we're going to be defining mul what mul multimedia is, we're going to get a big picture of how multimedia is currently used in uh, education, and we'll be looking at some pedagogical issues uh, as well that, that really reflect uh, or, or convince or persuade individuals why they should in fact invest in multimedia technology, or at least use it. Uh, we'll be talking a, a variety of topics, uh, including uh, screencasting and video editing and audio capture and things like that. And there'll be opportunities for question and answers at the end. Now, it appears that it, it just is at the end, but I encourage anyone who does, in fact, have a question to ask it to, while we're in the middle of the session. OK. So. Uh, I'll be, uh, the objectives for this workshop is by the end of this uh, session, you will be able to identify multimedia, what it is. You'll be able to identify at least five multimedia tools to enhance your instruction, some of which you can use immediately. And also select at least one tool that you could use immediately to, uh, that would benefit your course, as I just mentioned. Okay, so what is multimedia? Multimedia simply uh, it means it, it combines two or more five basic types of media into the learning environment. So if I just had uh, text, that would not be multimedia. But if I combine text with a video or a sound, for instance, you can actually see the text, but I'm also including my uh, accompanying narration. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you while you're also seeing this. I could also use graphics, and you can see right here an example in the lower right-hand corner of the graphics. This is the logo of the university and animation as well. And so we, we can combine just two of these, that would be multimedia. But of course, in some cases, we combine more than two, which gives a better sense for what multimedia uh, is in fact all about. Now, in terms of the justification, there was an article, actually it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit dated now, but still uh, just as relevant by Tony Bates in EduCause Review uh, that discusses the impact of multimedia technologies uh, for individuals who uh, have used them. Why would they want to use them? And that could be a, an increase in flexibility and access to learning, uh, resulting in new markets being reached, particularly the lifelong learner markets. So individuals who may actually not be able to come uh, to class, for instance, and maybe it's a long drive. Maybe they're living in Chicago or maybe someplace in Wisconsin, and they like to attend an NIU uh, course but not able to do that. By providing this multimedia access, and this, this is a good representation of it uh, in Blackboard Collaborate support, um, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, what we're in right now, is it gives them flexibility to participate and, in fact, either in real time, as my uh, session last night resulted, or actually uh, in, in um, asynchronous format so they can listen to the recording of the live session. So it actually expands accessibility to learning, which is an important uh, feature if, you, if you're trying to promote and market your um, market your uh, university and what it offers. The use of multimedia also focuses on the enhancement through these multimedia technologies of psychomotor and intellectual skills, including problem solving and decision making skills. Okay, and that's enhanced by the ability to share things multimedia in a multimedia format. It also provides the um, ability through internet technologies to sharpen knowledge management and collaborative learning skills and to learn and, uh, and to design global multicultural courses and programs. So you can use all of these uh, additional technologies to enhance the instruction by including these things 
which may not have been possible if you were just using just one technology like text-based instruction. All right, so now it's time for another session or another uh, another poll. Okay, so I'd like to ask um, in this poll question, it'll be a yes/no question. Have you ever incorporated multimedia instruction in your face-to-face -face courses? All right, I'm going to start that. And once again, if you could click on the icon next to the hand, it looks like a little bar chart, and you. Uh, you can respond to that, okay? So, okay, I say that we've got three people who said that they have done that in their face-to-face -face instruction. Uh, we're not getting uh, others responding, so I'm just gonna assume that they have not done that. And by face-to-face, -face, I mean, you know, uh, maybe you're, and, and actually you just don't realize it, but you have done it. If you present it in front of students and you're speaking to students with PowerPoint, or with some other source, then of course you've used multimedia. However, let's put a little spin on that. Have you done this in a, um, my yes no box went away, but it, I've done it. Oh, okay, well thank you. All right, so I'm gonna ask you a, a second question. Have you done this in an online setting? Okay, so once again, go down to that little icon, little view, uh, view poll. And, and respond yes or no. Oh, okay, I see that four people have said yes. Okay, great. I'm gonna leave it up there a little bit longer and for people to give uh, people a little bit more time to respond to it. Okay, so one person, oh, I guess one person actually has changed the response. Okay, well, that's fine, that's fair too. Um, I should actually incorporating myself too because I have, uh, are answering myself, I've actually had this experience. Okay, Bill says no to online. Okay, well, thank you so much, Bill. Okay, so I'm gonna show this response there. You can see that we have four people uh, saying that they have done it online and one person saying that they have not. So I'm gonna clear that up, okay? And I'm gonna go on to the next, the next slide. So let's get a bigger picture of the use of multimedia. Okay. According to Abathe Asna, the world in which we live in is changing rapidly and the field of education is experiencing these changes, in particular as it applies to media services. The old days of an educational institution having an isolated audio-visual department are long gone. The growth in use of multimedia me uh, media within the education sector has accelerated in recent years and looks set for a continued expansion in the future. So we're just going to see more and more of this as we proceed through, through time. Okay, so let's look at some other reasons why we might want to consider the use of multimedia. Look at learning styles, and that is students preferentially take in pro and process information in different ways by seeing and by hearing, or by reflecting and acting, logically, reasoning logically or intuitively, analyzing and visualizing steadily and in fits and starts. So we have a whole range of how people prefer to learn information or bring in information. And so we, we do that, uh, we accommodate as instructors, as teachers, as faculty, in our meet, uh, teaching methods that we offer. So some instructors provide uh, inf information primarily in the, in the format of a lecture. Others prefer to demonstrate, or others lead students to self-discoveries, and such as problem solving. Some focus on principles, while others focus more on applications, and some focus or emphasize memory, while others uh, emphasize the need to truly understand information. All right, so some of these topics, okay, I've got a couple of chats I should look at. Oh, okay, actually that was, that was Bill. Thank you, Bill, uh, that we'll be looking at. And these include, Okay. Video and uh, video and audio capture and edit. Uh, it's one of my more popular uh, workshops. People have video they want to work with. They want to be able to do something. And all and and by and by, when people come in with video, it's raw footage. And uh, I'd like to think that the magic happens in the post-production area. That's that's after you've recorded the video, so you can you can identify exactly what you want. But we'll talk about that a little bit more. The development of tutorials, and these tutorials actually are uh, Faculty development uh, is very well known for, for the plethora of tutorials that they offer, and we'll, we'll look at some examples, 
Okay. Podcasting. Podcasting is still incredibly uh, popular. It's actually something that, that faculty development had developed a long time ago, but um, we have slowed down. In fact, we don't really offer a podcast. We used to offer Teaching with Technology podcast, uh, which we have, uh, um, I guess, uh, closed down. Okay, but it's actually something that's still very popular. If you look at N NPR, there are so many shows that are podcast and that people have access to, which is nice because we're talking about an asynchronous, asynchronous approach to getting content. Another uh, example is Blackboard Collaborate, which is both synchronous and asynchronous. It's synchronous now in that it's in real time, it's live. If somebody asks a question, I can respond to that question. But just as I had mentioned uh, in my um, uh, opening remarks that I had actually had a uh, real session last night, uh, a synchronous session with my students. I also recorded it. So this morning I made it made the recording available to students so students can go in and listen to it if they weren't able to attend last night's session. Uh, I also offer a number of Mac-based programs and we'll be discussing what those are. And so, and then video capture. Okay, and so in my video capture uh, class, we talk about capture from a variety of different sources. And now this is actually older technology, but people still use it. I have people who have uh, uh, videotape from from some material that they uh, that they've uh, had for a while, and they want to be able to capture it. And, and we discuss actually copyright and copyright infringement and fair use in the workshops so that people are not violating copyright. Usually it's a matter of getting permission to use it. So even though if you own the the format or the, uh, or the medium, so you own a VHS tape, which is kind of old, not too many people have that, or a DVD, you want to make sure that you have permission to use that uh, from the owner, the copyright owners, and we discuss those issues as well, or a VCR, so DVD or, v or VCR. Also, there's a camera, and in this case right here, more more likely safer because you're collecting your own information. Um, and so, in this case right here, this is a a digital camera. We actually have an out that goes into a capture device. Uh, but more and more, we're getting a lot of people who have uh, recorded video in smartphones, or the use of smartphone uh, technology or tablets, and we use the, the technology actually to, uh, to more easily upload uh, content and be able to begin uh, uh, editing. And in fact, in some cases, there are editing software programs that you can download as apps to your smartphone or to your, or to your, uh, your tablets. So in this case right here, we have an opportunity for uploading video directly to your YouTube account and then sharing that video, of course, if, if you don't need to do a lot of editing. And in fact, even in YouTube, there are there is a, um, I'd call a minimalist editing software uh, application that you can use to, to modify it. It's not going to give you all the bells and whistles that standalone uh, units or, or applications have, but it's still good enough. This once again is an example of our video capture device. It's actually a little bit older. We don't really have a lot of uh, video capture uh, devices like that now because they've been pr uh, replaced by by uh, more and more less conspicuous devices. Some like this right here. Okay, have an opportunity. So if I had a capture, or if I had a device that had a um, I guess this is I'm um, getting I'm 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 blocking on this I guess uh, I'm forgetting the name of this type of a of a device, um, but this is a S video capture. This is a RCA capture or composite capture. Um, still blocking that particular one like this, but it's a technology that that is is somewhat older. A lot of times we have technologies that actually just rely on USB or if you're using um, uh, if you're using a Mac device, there are uh, very small, I think Lightning uh, Lightning uh, is the name of the cable that actually will fit into your uh, Mac uh, device and it really makes, it speeds up uploading content uh, tremendously. But for those individuals who, who want to be able to do standalone video editing, we can upload the video and I'll show you how to use Pinnacle Studio, which is a PC related or Windows based a software program that allows you to do incredible things with your audio. Uh, we also have uh, a lab that has Macs in it, and so we ha we use the iMovie application in Macs. In my workshop, it actually looks at at the features of of uh, uh, e editing with Mac users. 
Audio capture, and this is actually one of the nicest ones from my perspective because it utilizes a, a technology or utilizes a software program that's downloadable for free. It is relatively sophisticated for something that's uh, that's uh, that's free, um, and it's relatively easy to use. And so the learning curve is, is not very steep at all in in, the, in this audacity. Okay. Uh, some examples in my video editing, uh, video capture, video editing courses. The use of video. Uh, when I used to teach my workshop in um, uh, for introduction to, to public health, I would use this video, which I believe is um, is uh, it's called Outbreak, and actually it's it's a movie that that highlights the the spread of a contagious disease. It's over dramatized. I really don't buy Dustin Hoffman as a virologist or an epidemiologist. Uh, but still, it's very intriguing, and I use this example in this. Uh, of course, th uh, this is a screen capture. I actually can't can't play it for you right now, but in my course, I actually would play it for my students. And it's just a short portion of it. It's not the entire video, and that would fall within fair use. Uh, use. This is another one, uh, unintentional injuries, and this actually is a video of, I think it was from World's Wildest Chases. And so inevitably, these chases end in traffic uh, collisions and accidents. Uh, and so I just sort of demonstrate that by playing this this brief video for the students. This is one of my favorite ones. It's on social justice, and this is a recording of a young child, a young black child who was who was going into school that had been desegregated in the South. There is this dramatic footage of of uh, 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 not just of, of this, but other other examples of social injustice and people trying to stop people from from doing what should be uh, their civil rights. Um, and there's this dramatic music in the background playing. It really gets the attention of the students. Okay, much more so than if I said, hey, this is important. You need to pay attention. I also offer an advanced video editing class in which we insert titles and subtitles. We insert music tracks within the video, uh, adding voice over. And I've had many faculty come in and add their voices over existing content, uh, inserting transitions from one video uh, segment to another video segment. We also offer a course in, in video streaming. Now, and actually, this has really modified itself quite a bit because now we, uh, rather than, than having a special uh, workshop that actually focuses on, on the different type of video streaming, we use a new convention in uh, video fi file formats, MP4, uh, which actually reduces the size of the video substantially and yet it maintains the integrity and the quality of the video. Uh, and so we have software that actually shows you how to do that easily. Uh, one example of how we now post content uh, which is outside of uh, of having to submit it to an outside vendor like uh, like YouTube, is that we have people actually submit it internally. We have a Helix Media Library uh, server, which actually has been updated to something called Medial, that allows faculty and students to upload content. Now, this is really important if you want to share content because video is so large. If you try to upload video in your regular Blackboard uh, uh, server, uh, first of all, uh, the Blackboard server is not a, a streaming media server, so it, it may actually not play very well. Um, uh, however, if you if you put it into the media server, it is a streaming server. It optimizes the flow uh, and the stream of the video, and you can and, and multiple people can watch it simultaneously. Whereas if 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 you have a very large class, maybe of 25, 30, 50, 100 students, and they all try to view it, and you have this video uploaded in your server, your Blackboard server. Uh, there's going to be some problems. So this actually addresses that that particular issue. We've actually had it on campus, this, this medial or this Helix Media Library service available uh, for almost a year now. We have a lot of faculty who are using it, but still, I think it's it's one of the university's best kept secrets. This is sort of a screen capture of my own material that I've uploaded uh, into video uh, into my Helix Media Library. And so the, the workshop actually shows people how to do that how to upload, how to make it accessible to students, and how their own students can upload for uh, assignments that actually can be submitted as videos. Uh, other ways in which multimedia has been used is the use of music. I had a colleague here who for many years uh, would offer a drug or substance abuse uh, uh, course, and she would incorporate the use of different types of rock and roll uh, musical pieces with her various slides. And so she'd be talking about drugs and deaths related to marijuana, ecstasy, cocaine, heroin, while these things were playing for her in the background. 
And in fact, if you look at the causes of death by, by substance abuse, you see that the, the number one cause of, uh, of, of substance, even though it's a legal substance, by far is tobacco. Kills annually about 430,000 individuals, whereas the number of people who die from marijuana is uh, closer to zero. And LSD closer to zero, of course, you know, that, you know, the use of statistics can be modified, so it gives a certain message. Uh, I've also have had workshops in the use of scanning to enhance presentations, and so they, they tend more to, to attract visual learners. Uh, this is an example of one that I used, and it was quite a long time ago, actually more than 10 years ago, but I'm just giving you as an example. I think this is the week I talked about unintentional injuries and, and, and actually resulting from, in this case, falls. And it so happened that there was in the Chicago Tribune in the um, um, the area where a lot of the, the, uh, the obituary section, it so happened that Dr. Robert Atkins, who of course is the weight loss guru, had had died from slipping on the street and hitting his head on, I believe, on the curb, the coming from that. Uh, there's also another individual who happened to die from the same cause, and that was Margaret Formby, a longtime civic leader and impetus behind the creation of the National Cowgirl Hall of Fame. Okay, they both happened to die from from an injury. Uh, this actually is, is for me closer to, to, to home for me because this uh, is a, for anyone who's familiar with Los Angeles Laker basketball, the longtime announcer for uh, the Lakers, Chick Hearn, actually died himself. Um, he struck and he fell, himself, uh, he fell and struck his head uh, and in his backyard and he died um, as a result of that too. So it may not have actually had a, a relationship to my students, but it did have a relationship to me, so I had to include it in our discussion about that. In terms of, of what is used to diffract energy, you know, like, like padded dashboards or in automobiles, this is an example of a, uh, a, a batting helmet that actually saved the life of this baseball player. He used to be a, a, a very famous player for the Chicago Cubs Sammy Sosa, and you can see that this is a, a picture that was taken of the ball ricocheting off of his helmet, and you can see shards of plastic uh, you know, as a result of being broken from the force of this blow. Uh, now, he was a little dizzy from it, but he would have probably suffered severe, perhaps career-ending, maybe even death as a result of of this uh, this uh, this ball hitting his head probably would have been better than than having this still image would have been a slow motion video of it so you can see it as it exploded as a result of absorbing the energy from the ball uh, that always was uh, really uh, very uh, impactful no pun intended for the students to to watch this one I would include this in my in my lectures another example would be I, I was talking about one day I was talking about the um, uh, organization of public health, uh, both at the national level all the way down to the local level. So to get a sort of a, a picture of that, actually I went out, I remember it was during November of the fall semester, it was really snowy, to take a picture of the local health department. And in fact, you can probably see here lots of snow that had been built up. Well, I had to climb over several mounds of, of snow just to get close enough to take this picture. And I really wasn't as close as I wanted to get. But this is an example of using, using an image. And I did, in fact, use a, a, a digital camera to, to record that. Uh, also wanted to get an example of, of a central, I guess this is a, a federal level um, uh, organization of the public health. And in fact, this actually was a, a, um, a scan of uh, a postcard that I took. I did my internship at the Centers for Disease Control in the fall of 1984, and I remember purchasing this thing, and I just happened to use this um, uh, for this class, actually. I never really actually used it to mail anything. It was sort of just one of my mementos of my, my time at, at CDC. At this point, I want to ask, are there any questions? I should be asking all along. And I'm looking, and I'm looking, and no questions seem to be coming up in the chat area or a little uh, hand going up in the air. So I'm just going to assume that that it's it's clear to, to folks. Okay. Another example of using visual imagery is the use of infographics. Now, they're extremely popular now. And the benefit of having an infographics is that it allows individuals to share information that at a glance reveals more information than if it was all put into a uh, text format. 
So I'm looking at the chart styles here. This is this actually is a pie chart. I know immediately it's a pie chart. And percentage of infographics with the following charts: 22% of the infographics actually are, in fact, um, up in the pie chart format. Uh, up to 32% for the bar chart format. So in one glance, I can get a lot of information. This is probably not the best one I could have chosen that actually demonstrates how you can share information in a glance and in, in one look, as opposed to having multiple pages of, of content that people have to sort through. Okay. All right, the next area that I'd like to touch on is the development of tutorials. Uh, these are recorded lectures, and this is an example of one where it's a software program that actually is so expensive, I no longer offer the workshop on this particular one. I believe the cost of this, this software program is uh, art articulate presenter is like $1,500. So although we do have the software installed on our, our computer, and it's very nice, it's, it has a lot of, it's very full featured, um, and anyone can come and use it. Of course, they're limited by when we're available, when we're open, and when the lab is, is also can be, can be reserved. Um, however, I've had a lot of great success in using it. It's a wonderful software program. Uh, also use it to create other types of tutorials. In this case right here, this is a timeline for abortion-related courtroom decisions. And you can see right here I have first period, second period, third period. Uh, I could link, right, click right here. This is 1981, and it would jump to that particular one, that particular court uh, decision. This is something which is very interactive. The students can have access to it. And it's not in any in, in the class that I'm teaching this semester, but it's in another class that I usually teach in the spring semester when I'm when I'm asked to do that. Um, and it really gives uh, students the, the idea or the sense that you've created something just for them. You can also create and, uh, and randomize uh, a list of, of uh, quizzes or questions. And so you could uh, conceivably have a PowerPoint presentation and maybe after 10 slides, you actually have a quiz, and you ask students to, to respond to the quiz. And so you see it's sort of a measure of how well they've learned that content up to that point, rather than waiting until the end of the whole presentation. And it could be that if they didn't answer uh, enough of the questions, that you would actually send them back to the location of that particular, where that content was that they got wrong on, so they can get a refresher. Now. Uh, I usually use it as a self-assessment. I don't really download or you know, have the students you know, uh, upload the content, uh, but I could. Uh, however, it's not something that, that I've, that I've uh, tried here. I would rather have my uh, official questions and quizzes and things that I create within Blackboard. Um, but like I say, I, I usually like to use this thing for self-assessments in the students. One software program which is more accessible than the Articulate Presenter is Adobe Presenter, which essentially does very similar things to the other much more expen expensive program. Uh, this is something that individuals can, uh, can purchase on their own, although I think that now Adobe has a different model of um, a business model in, in terms of how people access this particular software program. Um, and I know that Pat Adams from the university is a person you want to talk to if you want to get access to uh, Adobe Presenter. So you can see right here in the middle, I have my slide presentation. Uh, below I here, I have a, a player control where I can play this or pause it. I can advance to the next slide if I, if I need to go, or I can go back to the next slide, the previous slide. Uh, on the left-hand side, I have a uh, what would be the transcript of my presentation, so people can actually view this. And actually, this would probably be beneficial for students with a hearing disability um, or individuals whose first language is not English, okay, making it available. But also in terms of universal design, it could also be beneficial for, for students who, who are, whose first language is English and who do not have a learning disability or hearing impairment. Uh, and it, it could actually be beneficial to them and they could read that as they proceed through the uh, tutorial. Uh, another way of, of recording tutorial is actually use of software that actually records what's going on on the screen. So actually, I, I do in fact ha am doing a screencast recording of this very same session as an alternative or as an adjunct to the regular recording and I can decide which one I want to use. Uh, there is Jing. Jing actually is something you download and record, but I think there's a limitation on the length of the recording, five minutes. Whereas Camtasia Studio 9, which is available for both Windows and Mac, allows you to record for any length of time. 
Um, ScreenFlow is another one. In fact, I'm using ScreenFlow on the Mac in the other lab across the, the hall from my office, and so I'll be able to see a recording of this very same presentation that will be available as a recording uh, for you. Um, and so this right here is an example of, of a, t a tutorial that I've developed. In fact, this is accessing the session one recording. And so I actually recorded a session uh, for my students uh, that actually says, oh, this is what you need to do to get access to that recording from last night's uh, presentation. And I'll walk them through the steps. I'll say, you want to click here in the sessions. And, and so it's really live. It's, it's, uh, it's very, um, uh, it's, it, it has a very real meeting as opposed to what we're doing right here, which is just static PowerPoint presentation. So it records all the activities. Anything that moves with my uh, um, with my mouse, it will pick up. If I want to, in post production, zoom in on a certain area, I can do that as well. And faculty development has quite a collection of, of these types of screencast tutorials, including one that actually is self-paced Blackboard instruction, uh, which actually I'm proud to say that I I worked on myself. Um, when you're actually working on the um, the uh, editing of the thing, it looks much like this. In this particular area, you can see the slide and you can control exactly what you're doing. In this case right here, it seems like I'm, I'm rising the, uh, raising the volume. I've actually added a musical piece right here, which is sort of an introduction to my video. So it adds a little bit more polish to what I'm doing. Uh, and you can do that. Uh, I believe that there are royalty-free musical pieces that you can add to, um, to the session. Okay. Uh, this is a, unfortunately, this, this is one of the, it's not unfortunate that it's one of the nicest uh, multimedia examples of uh, use of technology. Um, it's just that it no longer is available. However, there are others and I'm exploring these alternative types. But what I'm going to show you right here is from Zaption.com. Zaption.com is closing down at the, as of the end of September. However, that's because, it's not because it, it's a, a representative of how uh, bad it is. It's actually because of how good it was. It was so good that it was bought out by another company, and this company is wanting to use the same technology for their own um, interactive uh, online interactive instructional piece. So they actually bought them out to be able to use that technology. However, let me give you an example of what that is. Of course, this is this is uh, a static image, but what what it in fact in this case right here, I took some of the video uh, from. Uh, from YouTube. And actually, you can take video from almost any source online, YouTube, Vimeo, um, uh, TED Talks, and actually go to the video portion that you want, and you don't have to have the entire video. You can just select maybe just a couple of minutes of it if you want to, and it will play up until a certain point, and then it'll stop. In this case right here, I've got uh, the video frozen, and it says, what indicators suggest that the condition is an infection? And this actually is from the video that I just mentioned a few minutes ago about, uh, about um, outbreak with Dustin Hoffman in it, in which people are in an isolation ward. They're all exhibiting the same symptoms. Uh, and um, uh, there's an, an opportunity. You know, you can see that the healthcare provider is, is very well protected herself. She's got... She's got gloves. She's got. She's wearing a long gown. She has eye protection. She has an, a face mask. So these are all things that are in, in, indicative of a of a, of a, uh, an infection uh, that is uh, that is very virulent. So it's an isolation ward. The healthcare providers are wearing masks. Patients with similar symptoms are all together, or all of the above, which of course is the answer. And so when people click wall above and submit, it will follow up with yes, this is correct. Or if they only select one, they'll, they'll, they'll uh, be informed why they should have selected all of the other ones as representative of an infectious condition. So that would be uh, interactive videos. Now, um, I will be offering interactive video coming up in this next academic year, uh, sometime probably in the spring semester. By that time, I will have found an alternative to Zaption.com. Uh, another example of uh, interactive uh, or, or, or a, a multimedia technology is the use of mobile screencasting. And what mobile screencasting is, is using something like a tablet in which you can actually use your, your finger or you can use a little stylus to write things down. In this case right here, this is, this is a screen capture, obviously of a, I, I, give, I believe it was exponents, and, and my, my colleague actually created this, where actually she's writing out x times x equals x square, 
And so she's writing it out in real time and explaining what happens when you multiply, when you break it down, you multiply x times x times x, and that's x cubed. But what about if you have x squared times x cubed? What, what would the answer be? Uh, and in fact, what's, what's really kind of cool is that, you know, she, you can hear her speaking as she's going. And then it proceeds to another screen where the, the response actually is, is, is uh, identified. Uh, this actually is very uh, instructive for uh, this type of, of, uh, of, of a field, like something where writing as opposed to just typing in things would be more useful, like, like mathematics. Um, uh, uh, or if you, in fact, uh, an instructor had an instructor who who used it for writing music, and then sharing that video for her students. And and what's nice is that she can share that that uh, video with her students for this semester, but come next time she teaches the course, she can also share that as well. So she's repurposing it, or maybe for the same course, not necessarily a different course, the same course, but in a different semester. Okay. Uh, one more way in which I use multimedia is for extra credit assignments in which I'm using uh, a feature which is very nice within Blackboard, and that is that Blackboard is, uh, allows me to, to identify uh, content in YouTube and share that content. So in this case right here, this, this video that I'm sharing and, and actually embedding within uh, this, this course is called Four Corners, okay, and it really talks about uh, end-of-life issues or assisted suicide or euthanasia. So this is an optional extra credit assignment I make my students and I, and I say after viewing this video, I want them to answer the following questions. And so what is the theme of this video? Demonstrate its relevance to the course. And identify three things you learned from the movie, all right, or the video in this case right here. And so they can score up to 10 points, uh, which actually may, it may seem uh, like, well, not so many points, especially since there are hundreds of points that they can possibly uh, score on. But as I mentioned uh, in, to them in the past, if in fact they were a few points short of the next highest grade, so they have a B and they want to get a B plus or a B plus and, and want to get, a, and get an A minus, if they had done this for 10 points and they were down maybe sh seven points shy, then by doing an extra credit assignment, it would kick them above that level. And I said, I can't tell you how many times I've had people at the end of the semester say, hey, you know, I, I want to do an extra credit assignment. I'm only five points short of, of the next highest grade. And I said, I'm sorry, but that window of opportunity has shut. And so I'm telling you at the beginning of the semester, and that's what I told my students yesterday, that to take advantage of this because these extra credit assignments, there are three of them, so they can score up to 30 points, are only available uh, throughout the semester. So the first one will be available for up until the mid mid-September, and then that will be closed down, then they have an opportunity for a second and then a third. But <clears throat> if they've done none of them, they can't go back when the end of the semester has happened and they're no longer available. So by having this, uh, this feature where I can actually have this video, and I keep it within my course instead of just a link that takes them to, to YouTube, because as you know, if you're in YouTube, there are all these other related videos and you, before you realize it, you've spent an hour or five watching other videos. Okay. Okay, another example of how I use multimedia in my courses, and, and actually this is sort of embedded in, in, in the instructor aspect or portion of, of my course. It's actually a video that they can, that students can play, and it's a, just a welcoming them to the course, what the course is all about, what my expectations are, my good wishes for their success, and identify some important uh, key assignments that, uh, that they'll be responsible for. And I also have this uh, there's also an opportunity to have this uh, caption, so I actually include co closed caption to this. So for individuals who are uh, hearing impaired or whose first language is not English, they're also able to, to benefit from that as well. Okay. I also offer a series of design tools um, for video, for, um, for audio, um, and for imagery as well. Okay. And uh, another thing, actually, we're, we're, we're using the various tech, the very technology I'm about to mention right here is the use of Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Now, of course, I use it for my own uh, sessions, but I also use it for my student presentations. You know, this since this is an online course that I that I offer, and we're not uh, we're, we are never face to face in any at any one time. 
throughout the semester. Uh, I want my students to make presentations, and so I'll use this, this same technology so that they, in fact, will be able to uh, make the presentation and, uh, and collaborate, because th these are group presentations, so maybe one member of the group will present for the first you know, 10 minutes of the presentation, then the next member will, will, will continue on presenting what they actually have created. I also offer workshops in the, uh, uh, for those individuals who use Mac, okay, the Mac uh, OS operating system, okay. I offer a workshop in GarageBand, which actually has to do with with video, uh, with audio uh, capture and editing. In fact, I use this every week uh, for my for my audio weekly greetings, which are recorded. In fact, in this particular case, uh, GarageBand offers a, a, a lot of different musical. Uh, uh, royalty-free musical interludes or pieces that I usually incorporate at the beginning and the end of my of my presentations. Uh, it's kind of nice to be able to have that uh, because it, it it offers a little bit more polish for the uh, for the users. Uh, uh, iMovie is another big one too. I've actually had people who needed to uh, needed to learn about how to use a movie editing software program. Uh, I said, well, I think you know, iMovie probably, even though that person hadn't used Macs before, they were actually able to, use, to learn how to use it within an hour and created a very sophisticated, well-polished uh, video presentation for the video files that they had. Uh, in fact, I consider this one person my success story, one of my many success stories on how to use that. And then finally, we have uh, another Mac-based program, ScreenFlow, which is simply just screen uh, screencasting for Mac users. Um, uh, in fact, like I said, I'm, all, I'm using ScreenFlow right now as we speak. Uh, as you can see, um, it's a very easy program to use. Um, well, you can't see that, but I'm telling you, it is a very easy program to use and, and edit after the fact. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to ask you to check the Faculty Development Monthly Schedule of Workshops. We sent out a, a, a link at the beginning of, or in, in, uh, toward the end of every month for the following month's presentations and workshops. Um, you you uh, will have to read the titles and the descriptions carefully to, to determine whether, in fact, this is a multimedia workshop. It, it, it will be, uh, uh, it's likely that at least one of these workshops will be offered a month. Uh, for you, maybe sometimes more than one um, uh, that I offer, and I welcome you to to come in and and uh, and share in learning these new technologies and be able to to use them immediately for yourself. Okay. So at this point, I'd like to ask: Are there any questions? Looking right now, no questions. All right, well, I, uh, oh, I did have a question. Yes, Jan, oh, none. Well, thank you for letting me know, Jan, I appreciate that. No questions, okay, so once again, this is, uh, this workshop really is an introduction to the, to the range of multimedia workshops that I offer, I enjoy teaching, whether that's in a face-to-face -face environment, in a workshop, if it's an online environment, or if you don't really have the time to wait for when it will be offered again, I'm happy to, uh, to invite you to come in as a consultation and I will uh, be able to teach you these things one-on-one. -on -one. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, then I'm going to stop the recording.